Okay, let's go to work. Um, violating the syllabus, I've retitled today's discussion from Marxist historic historicism to Howard Head's tennis racket. And let's begin with Howard Head's tennis racket. Howard Head was a, um, an alum of Harvard College, uh, a bright guy, and a not very good uh, airframe engineer. He was a second class designer of the details of airplanes for McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And he was an avid skier and an avid but very untalented tennis player. And as he tells the story, there was a night on a bus, a motor coach to use his words, uh, bringing him uh, back to New York from uh, Vermont, from Stowe. And he'd had a rough weekend of skiing. And he said, what would happen if we took the aluminum wafer with which we're building airplanes and made a ski from it? And sure enough, he did that. And the skiing industry, not just the sale of skis, but the total size of the skiing market was transformed forever because skiing now became more fun and vastly easier. Uh, five years later, uh, he had the same, he applied the same thought process to tennis rackets. At the time, the world market in tennis rackets had converged on the Bancroft uh, wooden racket, uh, named for Jack Kramer, who died, his obit is in the Times this morning. Uh, and everybody was competing on price and details of quality with the wooden racket. And there were no rules about how big a racket could be. And it occurred to Head that if he substituted in the bow of the racket, substituted aluminum for wood, the structural properties of aluminum would allow the head of the racket to be much bigger. Uh, do any of you play with giant tennis rackets? I know it's a point of pride among really good players not to do that. Uh, mine, I, I retired from tennis three or four years ago, but mine at my retirement was <laughs> about like that. And it makes tennis easy. And it created a mass market. And it redefined the whole business. Now, the idea of creative destruction, which is usually about things more complicated than skiing and tennis, uh, the whole idea of creative destruction is that the process of competing to sell the best product at the lowest price within the given market framework often does indeed lead to something like monopoly or at least oligopoly. And uh, a point made at length by Marxist critics of capitalism. But as, the, as that happens, it, it occurs over and over and over again that somebody like Howard Head finds an alternative technology invariably aimed not at luxury markets, aimed at regular people, and very seldom aimed at uh, corporate or governmental buyers, but again, at private sector buyers, and generates with that product an entirely new market, shatters the equilibrium, hits it with a hammer. And this thought is, on the one hand, antagonistic to Marx. That is, it is a way of refuting Marx's idea about monopoly capitalism. On the other hand, it is exactly in the spirit of young Marx, the young Marx we hear in the Communist Manifesto read for today's assignment, who saw capitalism as an enormously productive system which was incapable of standing still, which was always leaning forward into the wind, which was, to use Schumpeter's term, nothing more than a mechanism for economic change. According to Schumpeter, the very essence of capitalism 
is that it is, it is a system always in, in the process of revising itself. It is never capable of standing still. And young Marx certainly believed just about that same thing and believed that the productive forces, and remember he's writing in 1847, 1848, that the productive forces associated with capitalism were unprecedented in world history. And may I call on one of your classmates to read the pivotal paragraph from that work. Thank you very much. Okay, so Marx is there talking about the, at the time he's writing, uh, railroads are just beginning to transform the European world around him. Steamships are a generation and a half into transforming world commerce. The use of uh, newly efficient steam engines in manufacturing is creating ever cheaper goods. The market in world textiles has driven the price of ordinary cotton cloth uh, nearly to zero, so that nearly everyone in the market, advanced market societies can afford to dress more or less the way all of you are dressed. Uh, that is to say, well, whatever, look around. Uh, but. The point is that the, the revolutionary transformation of the means of production and of what is produced and at what cost it sells is very much on Marx's mind. Additionally, Europe is politically unstable in the 1840s. And there are five or six uh, nodes of apparent revolutionary activity stretching from uh, Austria through Germany into Tsarist Russia, and Marx imagines that his relatively abstract analysis of capitalism is scientific. And by scientific, he means that it has predictive force, that his science of economy and society is so powerful that it allows him to foresee the future not to foresee the exact dates and details of future history, but that the broad outlines are beyond human control. So there are actually two assertions here. One is that the world's history is determinate, that it is like the machinery of the heavens. It is like the planets revolving around the sun. A good astronomer can readily predict the phases of the moon, the occurrence of eclipses, all those things. And that science which was in the past by Marx's time and which he saw, he, he aspired uh, to that level of confidence. And we're gonna look at his historicism, that is the double belief that the world is deterministic and that he and his associates can actually unlock the keys to the future under six headings, uh, the first of which is monopoly capitalism, and we'll, we, we'll take that up momentarily. Second is the proposition that in the long run, the rate of profit for capitalist enterprises has to fall. Uh, third, the emisceration of the working class, that as profits fall, so does the wage stream available to the working class. So both the capitalists and 
their adversaries in the proletariat face a squeezing vice which takes their discretionary power out of the system. Uh, as the vice squeezes, revolution becomes inevitable. That's the fourth point on the, or the third point on the chart. Uh, the fourth point is Marx's, I'm a great respecter of Marx's uh, brilliance, uh, but the, the, the theory of the universal class is almost childlike. And the idea is that if you search out the bottom of the bottom of the bottom classes, then that class will have the unique property that it has no one else to exploit. And if it has no one else to exploit, then there won't be exploitation. And since the purpose of the state is to defend the interest of an exploiting class, then the state will become unnecessary and will, as the bottom line says here, wither away. Now, the, the many decades of experience we have lead us to be uh, friendly critics toward the top of this story and unfriendly critics toward the bottom because the story told at the bottom is uh, not only uh, false, uh, but dangerous. Okay, monopoly capitalism. You'll remember that I, when I was uh, sitting with Jim Alexander last class, uh, talking about Adam Smith and the conditions under which the invisible hand remains invisible, I used the Porter forces, commonly used in MBA uh, instruction, uh, to define the opposite of each of the conditions uh, put forward by Smith. And so I'm using them again here. And in a monopoly capitalist situation, the monopolistic firm uh, has eliminated direct competition or rendered it trivial. Uh, it, has ha it has caused the erection of high barriers to entry so that as its profits increase and others say, what a good idea, let's get into that business, it has ways of keeping them out. Or, once they come in, of punishing them uh, to the point of bankruptcy. Uh, third, these are products that are not discretionary. They're hard to substitute for. You can't have a serious monopoly in children's games. You can't have a serious monopoly in a given fragrance of aftershave lotion or of perfume. Serious monopolies are, in, are always in things which people need and for which they don't readily find substitutes. Uh, the firm is vertically integrated and uh, by, by vertical integration I mean, think about starting, well let's take, uh, take the laptop in front of you. Uh, starting with the aluminum, the silica, uh, the metal wires, all that stuff, starting with raw materials that are in the earth, extracting those, designing them, fabricating them, marketing the machine, distributing the machine, that whole long trail of production from raw materials at the one end to finished product in the hand of a buy hands of a buyer at the other, Vertical integration in the extreme means that the corporation controls that whole sweep. The part that reaches from manufacturing toward the buyer is called forward integration. The part that reaches from the manufacturer back to raw materials is called backward integration. But this pattern of integration gives the company great power because there are no suppliers who can hold up the firm for a, par a part of its profits. Buyers don't have leverage to control prices. Uh, competitors can't manufacture a very similar machine 20% cheaper and drive down profits. And people in substitute industries don't have any way of drawing away customers. So that's the, I'm caricaturing, uh, but 
Things which more or less fit that description historically would be, for example, Standard Oil. John D. Rockefeller, who controlled, who came into control of oil all the way from exploration and the wellhead uh, through refining uh, and distribution. He came to control the railroads, which his rivals would need to use to distribute their product, and managed to use the railroads to impose uh, artificially high freight prices on his competitors so that he was able, in effect, to monopolize the whole industry. The U.S. Steel, a similar story. This would, this, this would be Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Microsoft, there, are, there, there has been a long debate about, about antitrust for Microsoft. And um, it's pretty close to a monopoly. It's, I look around the room and I see little white apples illuminated everywhere. And I have one myself. Um, my eldest daughter is a partner level executive at Microsoft. And in her house are Apple computers, which I have given her family. <laughs> um, uh, another kind, another story of the same instance is the regulated airlines. The regulated airlines, this is before the late 70s when the airlines were deregulated, would own a route and monopolize it. And they would compete uh, not on the basis of price because they would charge monopoly prices. They would compete on the basis of food and attractive flight attendants. And there are, I'm not going near that. <laughs> um, the big pharmaceuticals, or pharmas, uh, are uh, sometimes in monopolistic or near monopolistic positions about drugs. And many other cases, though fewer than the ideological critics of capitalism would make you believe, and fewer partly because of creative destruction. As monopolies ossify, people find ways to blow them up. Okay, so let's, tr let's talk about that. And on the left side of this little diagram, we have ways to build a monopoly. And on the right side, ways to burn a monopoly. And on the vertical, we have market forces. Uh, and on the horizontal, the top horizontal, we have market forces. The bottom horizontal, we have governmental forces. And let's just get ourselves familiar with the four resulting cells. Scale and scope. Um, mostly scale. If there are returns to scale so that each widget gets cheaper to produce as you produce many of them, the firm which is producing the largest, the largest quantities enjoys an enormous strategic advantage. Illustrated here, if number of widgets produced is on the horizontal dimension and the marginal cost of the last widget is vertical, being positioned where this little green company is positioned is an enormous advantage in comparison with the little orange firms at the left. They, these are boutique firms doing very little and the giant producer, which in the American economy for a very long time was General Motors, for example. Uh, and it's General Motors and its immediate competitors in Ford and Chrysler. But if you, th let's, I'll, I'll illustrate the point. In, at the time of uh, the decade before World War I, there were 1,200 automobile manufacturing companies in the United States. And almost all of them got winkled out by the end of the 1920s. There were about a dozen at the end of the 20s. And we're now approaching, what number are we going to end up with? Zero. Zero is one real possibility. Uh, more likely, I think, 
one, one and a half, two, something like that. But the, e the scale economies in that kind of business are enormously important. Creative destruction. And here we have Schumpeter again. And one way of using Schumpeter is to take a very long view of dominant uh, technologies for energy and production and look at how they have shifted over time. And in this chart, is that legible for any of you or not? Not really. Okay. Uh, the, um, the chart begins with production based on water power, on uh, mills based on falling water. And it turns out historically these were very important. The first great, uh, uh, great advances in the manufacture of textiles occurred in plants located along the fall line of rivers where it was possible to extract a great deal of energy from falling water and drive mass manufacturing. Uh, then, a sec then you have creative destruction with the emergence of steam and rail as alternatives. Uh, then electricity. And I won't pause long, but the great battle of the 1890s was between alternating current electricity, controlled by George Westinghouse, and direct current electricity, uh, controlled by Thomas Edison, both of them as corporate leaders. And uh, Yale didn't fully give up on direct current uh, technology until about 1985. Um, there were dorm rooms where the lights were actually run on direct current generated in a plant over near where the swing dorms are now. Um, I'll leave it to sections for you to parse this out. It's actually a very interesting story. The advantage of direct current electricity is it can't kill you. Doesn't matter how much, it's not going to kill you. Uh, the disadvantage of direct current electricity is that as you put it through a long transmission wire, you lose most of it after the first five miles. So uh, Edison controlled direct current electricity and wanted to make the government regulate it in. So what did he do? He stressed safety. And so if Edison had won, there would have been a, a generating plant about every five miles all over the country in every urban neighborhood, its own generating plant. And how did he dramatize that? Yes, electric the electric chair, exactly. He, it, he put forward the view that, well, Westinghouse has a great technology if we want to do is kill people and actually did demonstrations on animals and all that sort of thing, it was just awful. Um, but ultimately, it was a case where the unregulated market won, the government stayed out of it. And alternating current from the point of view of illuminating uh, our classroom is pretty efficient. Uh, then you get petrochemicals and digital networks. This is all very stylized, this diagram. But the point is, that monopolies by one after another after another get winkled out by these changes in the underlying technology. Right? New Haven at one time was uh, arguably the leading manufacturing city for horse-drawn carriages. Well, it was over and over pretty suddenly. Regulatory capture. Uh, regulatory capture means what it says, and there's a, a basic political science-y kind of a thesis about this, which is that regulatory agencies uh, get captured by the companies they regulate. That if I'm a, a bank or a brokerage, I'm intensely interested in the SEC, and I develop friendly relations with it. I feed information to its, its staff. Its staff comes to rely on me. After 
spending a cycle of four or eight years in a politically appointed position in the regulatory agency. It occurs to people that they might pursue a career in the re industry they've been regulating. And so there gets to be a reciprocal relationship there, which allows a dominant firm to enjoy some advantage from its relationship with the regulator. Um, the, the current crisis in banking is a little different from this, and it's not really monopolistic, but it is not unfair to suppose that Goldman Sachs has enjoyed a fruitful relationship to the federal government in the last four or five decades. And that there have been very few times when there wasn't a Goldman Sachs partner in a position to influence uh, key decisions. The more classic story would be the airlines one I told you, where um, TWA, Pan Am, and all the others of that era uh, had this monopolistic relationship created by airline regulation. And what killed them was that enjoying a monopoly relationship to uh, the uh, airline regulators allowed them to be pretty soft. They didn't have to control costs. They could waste 15 cents of every dollar in profits and still look great to their investors. But when deregulation came, the legacy costs uh, were lethal to many of these firms because uh, they were up against now, they were up against airlines like Southwest, which had no legacy costs and ran very efficiently. Finally, antitrust. Uh, antitrust emerges in the states with the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 uh, and is, there's a continuous oscillation in government policy here and in most other market economies between strict and not so tr strict interpretation of what counts as a monopoly and what counts as predatory monopolistic behavior. When we get to cases, we will see several specific instances of this. Falling rate of profit. Uh, remember those of you who were here the first class, the slides that contrasted uh, labor intensive production. And for example, I had two yaks pulling a plow in Tibet juxtaposed to a 20-ton uh, John Deere tractor uh, tilling earth in Minnesota, Iowa, or some such place. And on the one side, you had relatively low production per labor hour, and on the other, uh, an enormously uh, high rate of production per labor hour, but based on outlays, uh, capital outlays for the equipment like the John Deere tractor, uh, well into six figures. The Marxist idea, this, I've got a better chart here. Um, the Marxist idea of how capital makes money from labor is that capital, uh, that labor is a commodity. And the labor theory of value more or less applies to that commodity. So how much do you have to pay for the commodity, which he calls labor power or laboring power? Well, you have to pay what it costs to feed uh, the worker, to clothe the worker, uh, to rear his or her children. Uh, you have to, it, the analogy is imagine you have a plow horse. What's it cost you to maintain the plow horse? Well, that same reasoning Marx applies to the workforce. And you pay wages that are broadly consistent with that. So in my diagram, let me show you this right, the laboring power is represented by the blue. And capital pays labor that much uh, for its activity. The total pie represents how much value is produced by labor. 
and what's left over is called surplus value. And capital, the capital, capitalist firm keeps the surplus value, by that means exploits labor, and by that means increase its, increases its wealth to create wealth. Now, that leaves out a lot. One thing it leaves out is the fundamentals of supply and demand for labor. Um, it doesn't take into account the idea that labor would be extremely cheap in this phase. Are there, how many people here haven't seen the dem demographic transition? Good, because we did it a couple days ago, but I never know about turnover. Um, so Marx is oblivious to that, except how would he answer if I said that? He would say, well, no, uh, labor is cheaper in these conditions because the s socially shared expectations for how well they have to be fed, clothed, and their children reared are low in those conditions. So village India, the cost of labor power is vastly less than it is in midtown Manhattan. Okay, that's, that's one issue. Uh, another issue, now well, this is the age curve, and, and it's just an, an embellishment of the demography. Another is how hard people work. This is a Bruegel 16th century picture of agricultural labor, which by the evidence there is not very intense. And the, the idea that you pay for what you get in labor is a powerful one. And the so-called scientific management movement of a century ago, which grew up around large manufacturing companies in the US and Europe, was that you develop incentives to make people work really hard. The simplest case was Henry Ford's $5, uh, $5 a day salary, which was way above market prices, but allowed him to be very choosy about his workers, to demand very intense labor, and to demand that they allow him to inspect their lives. He had uh, what he called sociologists who went around to people's houses looking for alcohol or devices for gambling and so on. Uh, but intensity of labor is another variable that needs to be thought of. Now, I just made that story sound really sensible, I think, right? But the logic of it has always escaped me, right? The notion that labor is different from any other standard for measuring value and that you can, you attribute to labor the whole pie, but actually you've got to attribute much of the pie to capital. And beyond capital, you've got to attribute much of it to ownership and intellectual, to management and intellectual property. Know-how, the ability to actually make widgets well and effectively at low costs, all that is left out of Marx's story. He assumes, he just says, necessary labor time uh, and draws attention away from what capitalism is best at, which is again and again revising the way we produce something, the way we distribute it, the way we design it, the way we design the machinery that creates it, even the way we design the machinery that designs the product, all of that is marginalized in a Marxist analysis. And for that reason, uh, Marxism does not function well in analyzing uh, real companies in real markets. Now, the <clears throat> surplus value that can be extracted depends on how much labor is used in production. And as total labor used in production goes toward zero, the opportunity to exploit workers goes away, and with it, profits, with it, profits have to fall. Now, and from that follows the immiseration of the working class. 
Now look at this bottling plant where the work is to sit at this control panel and adjust the process, plus a little maintenance. Have any of you been in a plant where there were virtually no workers present? Can you hand him the mic? Um, it was the celestial seasoning, or is that all? Or the celestial, that's all. Uh, the celestial seasoning speed factory in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. Putting up all, it's just machines like putting, for the rings, putting them into bags, securing them. And then there are like three or four workers in this huge room sitting at the screen, projecting. Right. right. Exactly. Other examples? In the back. Can we get a, get a mic back to the very last row? So very high degree of automation. I was some years ago in a um, textile factory in, in Turkey, which covered uh, six acres of interior manufacturing space. And every, every square foot of it was either a, an aisle between machinery or machinery. And virtually all the machinery was working. And the cloth was coming out in bolts like this at 10 or 12 different points. And automata were throwing it on conveyor belts, and conveyor belts were uh, taking it where it needed to be for shipping and labeling it and having it ready to go. And when I was there, there were about six people in the plant, uh, all of them technicians. Uh, and the story about the plant was that it could operate that way for as much as 60, 60 hours. And then there would be a shutdown for a few hours of maintenance and, and adjustment and then another 60 hours and so on. Uh, another historical example is the Bonzoc cigarette machine. Cigarettes were not popular before the Bonzoc cigarette machine. And the Bonzoc cigarette machine could make 6,000 cigarettes per hour, which they, they're now much better than that. They're 100,000 an hour. But at 6,000 per hour with zero labor cost, uh, it occurred to the people who formed American Tobacco that they could make an awful lot of money if they created a marketing end that would allow them to pump all those thousands of cigarettes uh, out into the market. And they did it and did a very good job of it. But at the core of it was this little piece of technology, continuous production, paper and, and uh, tobacco leaf go in one end of the machine and cigarettes neatly stacked in consecutive order come out the other. So capital intensivity takes labor out of the picture. So in effect, the dead who created the machinery are the producers. Uh, inevitable revolution in advanced capitalist societies. The idea here is that with falling rates of capital and the immiseration of the working class, this system ceases to be stable. And this is a guy named Georgi Plekhanov. And Plekhanov was a Marxist who was a follower of Lenin's. And he's famous for having asked the question, if the revolution is inevitable, why must we fight and die to make it happen? Right, and that's an interesting question. And it's, it gets the name Plekhanov's par paradox. Uh, and of course the answer to it is that the revolution wasn't inevitable. And where it did happen, it didn't happen for the reasons Marx described. Where, did, where were the most advanced systems where you would expect the capital intensive production, falling rate of profit, uh, and low wages to labor. Where were those systems? Let's name a few countries, yes. UK, Germany, and the US. UK, Germany, the US. 
And those are not the places where the revolution happened. It happened uh, most dramatically in uh, Russia and then by conquest in the rest of the Soviet Union. Uh, and Cuba, uh, but this, is a, this is Fidel on the right and Che Guevara on the left. There was, the, I have a photograph in my collection at home of Fidel Castro at the New Haven train station and a New Haven policeman looking at him like he's from Mars. And it was just after the revolution when they hadn't, when the break with the US hadn't really hardened and he was on a university tour speaking on college campuses trying to raise money for the revolution. Uh, Cuba was not an advanced capitalist economy and still isn't. The, the best thing you can say about, I've been twice and have been a guest of the government once and the best thing you can say for them is that they actually have done a splendid job with rudimentary public health so that on the longevity dimension of the data automation we looked at, if you'll screen it up tonight, you'll discover a little green moon, way, way high side outlier on longevity, and that's Cuba. On the other hand, they are dirt poor. China, not an advanced industrial economy when, this, when the revolution occurred. Venezuela, an oil state. And whether the revolution has occurred or not is open to question. And this, at the height of the Cold War, was the way the chessboard looked, where red meant Marxist and, uh, and pink meant sort of Marxist. And the, the game of controlling emerging market countries was at the core of Cold War strategy or very near it. Uh, the theory of the universal class. If the aristocracy uh, exploits serfs in uh, medieval uh, European society, and capitalists exploit proletarians in capitalist society, and proletarians come to power, who are they going to exploit? There's no one below them. Since there's no one below them, they are the universal class, and exploitation is over. Now, please. So the reasoning is like the Eastern Division of the American League. And Baltimore is the universal class because there's no one they can beat. Um, the, the, what's at the core of this last thing, and, and it is truly dangerous reasoning, is that the universal class being in a position superior to no other class brings an end to exploitation. Well, and since that's true, the state can wither away. Now, uh, it doesn't happen in a hurry. And behind this is a really fundamental issue of principal agency. Did we talk about principal agency a few days ago? Maybe not. Well, let's just for simplicity, let's suppose the people own the country and the communist government is the agency that they have elected to choose or which has chosen itself to manage the country on behalf of the people. The principal agency problem, which occurs in things as small as a grocery store, is that the employees, agents, choose instead of serving the purposes of the owners or the country, choose to serve purposes of their own. And the invariable fact about state socialism was that the people at the top of the state apparatus uh, privileged themselves 
and their children. And a new class struggle developed. Now, more generally, uh, and here I'm using the work of a, a sociologist named Ralph Darendorf, economic sociologist who died just a few weeks ago. Uh, and Darendorf's point, which I'm sure is true, is that you can generate classes around any process of production and distribution. There is nothing final about the proletariat coming to power. And there is never a time in human history when we'll be done with the possibility that those who control the direct levers control them not to the benefit of others, but to the benefit of themselves. And so Francis Fukuyama, who famously wrote a book called, that had, had the punchline, The End of History, after the Cold War ended, his view was that capitalist democracy became the end of history, the unchangeable end point. And of course, that's not true. The course of history is not, contrary to Marx, a determinant. Marx was not only wrong about his own ability to understand the course of future history, he was wrong about the very concept that there could be a deterministic theory which told us what was going to happen in the future. This guy, Schumpeter, who I know you hate the way he writes, uh, but he understood that point profoundly. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to elaborate him. I'll do it at the beginning of class next time. But the guy who comes to center stage next time is F.A. Hayek, whose most famous book was called The Constitution of Liberty, and who believed that a market society had within it the capacity for enormous creativity and growth. And we'll examine that in class on Wednesday.